Hello, welcome to chapter 9, Running Water and Groundwater. So in this chapter, we're going to look at the different ways water uh, acts in terms of how streams are formed, how streams uh, act with the, what's being carried along with them, and then the, process, the hydrologic cycle in terms of where the water is, comes from, where it's going, and how this whole cyclical nature works. So let's jump right into it. So first, let's take a look at where the water is on Earth. Now, the bulk majority, you know, of the water covering, you know, 70% of Earth is covered in water. Well, 96.5% of that is the oceans. 96.5 of the water on Earth is the oceans. So that leaves very little. <laughs> Uh, to you know actual fresh water that we uh, that we have so you see that there's saline lakes and groundwater at one percent and then fresh water at 2.5 percent so only 2.5 percent of the water on earth is fresh water that would be technically you know something that we could drink but wait it gets worse 68.6 <laughs> percent of that groundwater is locked up in glaciers and ice and we've already talked about this a little bit um and 30 percent of that is groundwater so it's underground that doesn't mean we can't get to it it's just got to drill a well and only 1.3 percent of the surface water is fresh water on earth 1.3 percent of the total water on earth needs to be able to sustain you know 7 billion people and of that, a lot of it's still snow and ice. So it's it's really, really small fractional part of what, you know, of the waters that we have can actually be deemed as drinkable by humans. And so you gotta take care of it when you can. So here are the, the, the processes that are involved in the water cycle. And I'll show you an image of that uh, in a shortly. So you have precipitation, rain, snow, right? That, you know, that's what we expect is precipitation. Then you have evaporation, which is the heating of the, the, the earth by the sun, where it goes back up into the atmosphere as condensation. You have infiltration, so when it does rain, some of that water gets down into the water system, into the ground, and either goes down into the groundwater system or, or moves its way into, let's say, a lake, which is just the groundwater table at the surface of the earth. And again, I'll show you the uh, image of this. You have runoff, which is, you know, when it rains, everything that flows downhill, carrying with it, uh, you know, sediments and uh, all everything that's associated with it. And then you have trans, uh, transpiration or evapotranspiration, which is when plants suck up the water in their root system that's in the ground, that real water gets transferred back into the plant at, in the form of water vapor and is then evaporated from the sun from the plants. So the, the little bit of water that's sitting on the, um, the, the, the leaves of the plants then gets evaporated back into the atmosphere. And that's actually a fairly large, significant portion of the water cycle. Here's a picture of the hydrologic water cycle. And what we have here is the oceans being 70% of the Earth's surface um, are heated up by the sun. A lot of the, you know, the oceans are in equatorial regions, not all of it. So there's higher amounts of evaporation uh, taking place near the equator than in the polar regions, but it's still evaporating. It gets up into the atmosphere here, and when the clouds can't hold all of that uh, that evaporated water, the water vapor, it comes back down in, in the form of precipitation. So then once it's on the ground, it has several options once it's on the ground. Um, it can either run off right back into the water system, it can or it can go infiltrate and then eventually it can also evaporate right off the surface or transpirate from plants like I just mentioned. So there's different options in terms of what can happen once the water gets back onto ground. <clears throat> now a huge part of this like I mentioned is evaporation or transpiration which is the sun again heating the surface of the earth and the small amounts of water vapor that come up through the plant root system 
that's a huge part of this water cycle. If you just look at the numbers here, obviously the biggest part is the evaporation from the sun but and precipitation over the oceans is a big part. But this number here is still bigger than, let's say, um, uh, the runoff value because, and that's why plants play a vital role in this whole hydrologic water cycle. And when the, um, we have, for example, at UWM, one of our professors studies the effects of global climate change and the rates of uh, plant transpiration in terms of uh, growing uh, lengths of uh, the growing season, how that's going to be affected, how the plants are going to react to this increase in global temperature. So it's, a, it's something that's being looked at actively and it can't be ignored, along with obviously the, the higher temperature the more evaporation there is, the more evaporation is, the, the more trip precipitation. So you're going to get you know, larger storm events and things like that. So you have running water, right? We have running water all over Earth. And we look at these in terms of what are known as drainage basins. It's the sort of the land area that contributes to a river. So everything within that particular area plays a role in whatever river is closest to it. Remember, in a nutshell, water wants to follow the path of least resistance, right? So if I have a drop of water and I, 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 it comes down as rain, it's going to want to follow that path down as quickly as it can based on gravity and where it can go. So these, that's what a drainage basin is. It sort of encompasses, all right, if whatever water falls in this area is going to follow this path, and then you'll have what's called a divide. And you'll see this right here. A divide that separates one drainage basin from another. So if water falls here on this side, it's going to flow down here and into this river. If it falls on this side, it's going to flow down here and then down to this area. Now, most of you have probably driven west on I-94. When you get to Brookfield, you go up that really, really big hill. And right at the top of that hill is the Brookfield uh, water tower. That is what's called a subcontinental divide. So if you're on the east side of that, when you're coming up the hill going west, all right, let's say you're going to uh, Brookfield Square and you're going west up that big hill, any water that falls on the east side of that goes back to Lake Michigan, which eventually goes through the Great Lakes systems and out to through the St. Lawrence Seaway to the Atlantic Ocean. If once you get over that hill, okay, and you're at Brookfield Square, any water on that side of that hill flows down towards the Wisconsin River, ultimately into the Mississippi River and out the Gulf of Mexico. That is a subcontinental divide. That big hill separates one huge drainage basin from another huge drainage basin. So here's the Mississippi drainage basin. The Mississippi River by far dominates the United States in terms of area for the, and you could see that in this green area here. All of these rivers play a role as to why the Mississippi River is as powerful as it is. It's being fed from a massive amount of area. Now, they subdivide these into some smaller ones, things like the Missouri River Basin, the upper Mississippi, kind of where we are. The Ohio River also flows into the Mississippi. So everything that flows into the Ohio River eventually ends up in the Mississippi, the Tennessee region, and then obviously the lower Mississippi region. So all of these rivers, all of these streams, and all of these little creeks flow into a much larger stream, a larger stream, and in this case, it, like for example, this lighter green area, this the Missouri River, which is a very big river as well, all of those streams, creeks eventually flow into the Missouri River. Well, you guessed it, the Missouri River then flows into the Mississippi River. At, that's where St. Louis is. I lived there for a couple of years getting my degree. So just north of St. Louis is where the Missouri meets the Mississippi. And the same thing applies with all the rivers up here, including the Wisconsin River. All of those flow down and eventually meet the Mississippi. The Wisconsin River meets the Mississippi River down in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. It's a beautiful area. If you've never been there, I strongly suggest 
suggest taking the drive. It's gorgeous. And the same thing applies for the Ohio, the, the Arkansas River. All of these feed eventually into the Mississippi River. And that's why the Mississippi River is as long and powerful as it is because it's being fed from all over the country. Now, the river systems have three main zones. Um, you have the area of sediment production, sort of where you know the river's first starting. It's picking up sediment. Then you have the transportation uh, area of it. So you can see that in this middle section here, zone of transportation. All of the sediment that was uh, created upstream is being just moved, moved, moved while the current is still strong enough to move it. And eventually when you get down to the mouth of the river, the current starts to slow down so much that the sediment that's been carried down all the way from the, you know, the, the headwaters then starts to settle out in the mouth of the river. And the Mississippi River is the easiest example of this. You can think of this, the Mississippi, the headwaters for the Mississippi are all the way up in Minnesota. And as it flows down, it flows down, it gets really flat here, it creates all these winding, these are called meanders, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's through, you know, especially through Missouri and Illinois and down through Arkansas, Tennessee, and the, uh, the state of Mississippi. Then once it gets down to Louisiana, the current slows so much that it starts to deposit at the mouth when it hits the ocean because the Mississippi River flows right out into the Gulf of Mexico. And that's where it creates this huge, that's, this is called a bird's foot. Um, and uh, it, it actually moves over time. So um, and the stream, you know, stream meandering and how they work and how they change over time is a whole science to itself. But uh, just know that there's three zones where the sediments created up at the headwaters, the, the trunk stream here in the middle where it's being moved along the stream current. And then when the stream current gets slow enough, it gets deposited at the mouth of the river. Now, with uh, streams, there's four main drainage patterns. And you'll see these all over the country, all over the world. Um, it depends on the terrain that the river is flowing through as to which one of these is going to occur. You have dendritic, rectangular, radial, and trellis. And uh, here's a graphic that will show all of those. So the dendritic pattern, excuse me, is sort of that the one most people identify with rivers. You have all these little branches that, you know, from here they feed down into the main trunk that goes in this direction. So all of these, uh, these up here, they're all flowing down into the main river going sort of down the image here. And that's kind of what we just saw with the Mississippi River, all these you know, things coming all, all these rivers come streams and creeks eventually meet down into the uh, main Mississippi River. You have the radial pattern, which is very common around volcanoes. All right, so you have the top of the volcano, a lot of, many of them are covered in snow, especially in the winter. And as it warms up in the spring and summer months, Sometimes it'll melt completely, other times you'll, it'll stay snowpack, but some of it will melt and create sort of this radial pattern because it's all coming down from a central point. It's not exactly one point, but you get the idea. So that's a radial pattern. Rectangular patterns here in the upper right are formed when you have highly jointed bedrock. And you'll see this um, kind of sometimes in desert areas um, uh, where it's kind of dry, but you have all this cracking taking place. It's not super common, but you do see it. And then you have this trellis pattern, which develops in areas of alternating weak and resistant rocks. And this is very common out west, um, where you don't have sort of the, you have lots of different bare rock formations and the water has no choice but to follow it along these sort of seams like this, and it'll find a weakness then cut across. It's very common in the Western states where there's very little like topsoil and things like that. So when water is flowing, and hopefully this will all make sense to you. I mean, hopefully you'll know this. How fast or slow a stream goes is going to be determined by the gradient or the slope. So if it's really steep, the water's going to run faster. If it's really shallow, you know, if it's really flat, the water's going to run slower. That should hopefully make sense to you. But there are other um, 
characteristics that influence the amount of stream flow, such as sh channel shape, the size, and then the roughness. Um, you know, it, if you have rapids, it could be going faster or slower than if you have a, a very smooth uh, uh, bottom. It all just depends on, again, slope, gradient, and then the shapes. Now, what's the, the, the gradient or the slope is the overriding factor because a lot of that has to ultimately determines the shape and the size of the, the stream. If you have streams that have real fast rapids on it, it's a steeper slope, probably you know more rocks and things like that. So that's, and it's, it has a tendency to be more straight. Not net, whereas the slower, lower uh, slopes have a tendency to have the meanders, the back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like you have in the Mississippi River. It's a, what we would call a lazy river. It kind of goes back and forth. Now, the discharge, the amount of water flowing in the stream past any one given point is usually expressed in cubic feet per second. And the bigger the stream, the bigger the number is going to be. Or <clears throat> the higher the, the flow, the higher the number is going to be. And the Mississippi River, in, in that case, is one of the largest rivers in the world and has massive amounts of stream flow. <laughs> a lot of water is flowing by. Even though it doesn't look fast, there's a lot of water flowing by at any, any given moment. So the, as you go from upstream to downstream in a river system, the profile, if you looked at it in three uh, cross section, is going to change from the, where the headwaters are until where ultimately the mouth of the river is going to be. And typically what you're going to have, and I'll show you a diagram of this, is that the headwaters at sort of the up, very upstream, you have a tendency to have higher slopes, higher uh, velocities of river um, uh, river flow, stream flow, and then as it goes further and further down slope and the slope starts to flatten out, the velocities slow down and you have a tendency to get more discharge. And then let me show you an example of that. So here you can see how the channel changes from head to mouth. And if you look at this diagram, when you're up here at the headwaters, so at the headwaters you have high slopes and then they eventually go uh, flatten out and you have higher channel roughness and then they flatten out. Now that makes sense. If you're going to go river rafting, you want that roughness. That's where all the rapids are created. That's where the big rocks are and everything. Now when you go on the flip side of that, when you go from the headwaters to the mouth of the river, the amount of discharge increases. So there's less discharge at the headwaters because the water's moving faster and there's more uh, roughness to it. The, the, whatever's in that water just kind of keeps going. The channel size is also gets bigger because there's there's very little to uh, for the water to go here. There's probably more rocks. You can see there's sort of one bend here, and then as you get out here, you get lots and lots of bends. And then obviously the flow velocity kind of levels off as well. So the, the upstream downstream changes that the factors that increase as you go downstream is the channel size gets bigger. So if you look at the Mississippi River, um, way up in the headwaters up in Minnesota, it's a much smaller river than as you move down, it gets much wider and much wider. And then the factors that decrease downstream. So as you go downstream, channel size gets bigger. But as you go downstream, the gradient or the slope gets flatter, right? You're not going to do whitewater rafting, and you know, as you go down the Mississippi River, you're go, um, the channel roughness also decreases sort of as it flows. Um, uh, because more of the sediment's able to just come out of the, the river. And that's why they call it the muddy Mississippi, because all of that sediment has come in from all the different channels. It slows down and just sort of starts to hang into the water, which gives it that, that brown muddy look and starts to settle out into the river itself. So here's sort of a cross section in California you can see the headwaters of this particular river way up here at a high elevation. 
So here's the headwaters way up in the mountains here. And you have a high slope, high slope, high slope. And it starts to flatten out, flatten out. And eventually, when you get way out here, this is where you get, you know, sort of more sediment um, depositing. I mean, that, you know, this is where all the farms are. <laughs> so this, there's more soil here and everything that's been deposited over millions of years. And what you could see, again, going back to the, the, the profile here, is this section here is where you want to do your whitewater rafting, right? So that's where the, the steepest slopes are, and you're going to have the most fun. Down here, this is where you might kayak or maybe tube, right? Two different activities, same river, depending on where you are along that river. Now, water is called the universal solvent. So it dissolves things. It's very good at it. And it moves things as well very efficiently. Now, depending on how fast the water's flowing will determine what gets um, dissolved, what gets deposited, and what gets you know sort of uh, moved around. So uh, water is constantly eroding everything that it touches. It, again, it's it's the, what we call the universal solvent in chem. That's a chemistry term. So it's constantly eroding, eating away at everything that it touches. So everything that it touches has to go somewhere. Sometimes it's completely dissolved in the water like this, and you don't see it at all. You know, tiny, 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 tiny little things that get dissolved into the water. Other things get suspended in the water, like silt and clay. That's what gives it, like the Mississippi, its muddy look, is this all the silt and clay that's sitting there suspended in the water. You also get what's called bed load. And bed load is all of the pebbles and rocks and everything that's kind of being pushed down river along the bottom. Now, there's a couple different ways. I know my picture is kind of in the way here. Sand can get moved by and pebbles and gravel can get moved by rolling you know it makes sense right they'll roll along the bottom they can actually slide along the bottom depending on you know the, the the angles or if there's a flat surface and they can also bounce which we call saltation why is that important because that ultimately will dictate sort of the shapes of the rocks and how big the rocks that it can move or pebbles are you know if you have high velocities it's going to be able to move boulders if you have low velocity it might be able to move sand and pebbles so what what's being moved along the bottom is dictated by the uh, velocity of the water above it an interesting phenomenon is uh, what are called potholes and what potholes are is as the water moved along, it got stuck in a whirlpool. And some pebbles or sand will get stuck in a whirlpool, and they'll just sit here and spin and spin and spin and spin. You see one here. You see one here. And they just sit there and spin and create these potholes, which are really interesting. Now, if you didn't know this, there is a state park called Interstate State Park way up in northwest Wisconsin. It's, it's, part, it's along the St. Croix River. So on one side of the St. Croix River is Wisconsin. The other side of the St. Croix River is Minnesota. It's way up there. It's above the Mississippi. And the Mississippi curves inward towards Minneapolis. The St. Croix keeps going north. And it's the border between US, um, Minnesota and Wisconsin. And in this state park, there's a ton of these. Interstate State Park is one of the most beautiful parks you will see in this state. I've been all over the state, and Door County is gorgeous. Uh, Wyalusing is beautiful. Interstate State Park is absolutely breathtaking. You have sheer two, 300-foot cliffs. It's, it's right on the river. It's very cool. Um, up, they call it God's country up there. That's why, where the name, the term comes from. If you ever get a chance, go see Interstate State Park. It's gorgeous. <clears throat> now, I already mentioned this, the transportation, the load is related to the stream's um, velocity. So how much discharge is based on how fast the water is going and what, you know, in, in terms of can it sustain moving boulders? Can it sustain moving smaller rocks, pebbles, sand, silt? 
and that is all based on the capacity. That's what we call the capacity, or the maximum amount of load that that particular stream can move at any given time. The competence, therefore, is the maximum particle size. So at the headwaters, you usually have a higher competence because it allow you to move boulders because the water is really moving. And then as you go through down into the meander section of a river, like along the Mississippi, its competence becomes less because it's it, it, it's wider. The, the, it's wider. There's a little less velocity, and you can only carry let's say pebbles, rocks, and then obviously silt and clay. Now deposition is caused when you know when the the flow of the river gets so slow that the those particles start to drift down through the water column and lay down onto the bottom so your competence is reduced when you get down to the, let's say the mouth of the mississippi the only thing left in that river is all of the little fine particles of silt and clay left and they those are slowly slowly being dropped out into the river system <clears throat> And this is known as alluvium. That's the geologic term for this is alluvium, and they're well sorted. So the the big boulders come out first, and then the, the rocks, then the pebbles, and eventually the, the silt. And you can see this in, in rock columns that are millions of years old. You can see this gradation right in the rock record. Um, I've done this in field trips, and we teach our students this at UWM, where if you go and you to a road cut, and you could see, oh, here down here is the bottom, here's the stream bottom, and then as you go up, you, the 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 layers of rock get smaller and smaller in grain size, because that at one time was probably an ancient riverbed. The other thing that's um, uh, apparent with river systems is things like deltas where um, the river exits into a ocean or a lake the, the the best example of this is obviously the mississippi delta down in louisiana that's a massive delta system and the thing is is it moves over time it's, it hasn't always been in the same position if you look at a geologic map of uh, Louisiana down there, you can see where the main channel has shifted. I believe it has gone eastward over the years, and then maybe something catastrophic will happen, and all of a sudden it'll change course. Um, there are natural levees and artificial ones along the Mississippi, of course, um, that allow, what that'll do is it'll sort of channel the stream in a specific direction. You have bedrock channels. That's you know where the the river is just flowing right through actual bedrock and slowly eroding it, and that creates alluvial channels where you have these again that gradation from big chunks at the bottom, and as it goes up, it's going to get smaller and smaller in size. We have meandering streams. Those are the, the where they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. If you didn't know this, out in western Wisconsin. There is a river called the Kickapoo River. I have canoed this. It's one. It is, I believe, the windiest river in the world. It. That's all it does. I'm trying to show you. It goes back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, and back and forth. And, <laughs> and it, it's fun to canoe. It's super slow. There's no rapids whatsoever. It's absolutely gorgeous out there. If I, I highly recommend doing that. Um, it's a fun. It's a long drive. It's about four hours from Milwaukee, I think uh three and a half maybe but it's beautiful and it's a lot of fun then you have braided streams which have it's a much more complex type of stream system where you have sort of all of those branches going off that's typically associated with slightly higher uh, velocities of streams so here's an example of a braided stream you have just enough velocity where it can kind of spread out. It's still depositing things. You can see that in here. All of the stuff in between these braids like this has been deposited, and it'll be deposited, and then the water will find a new path to take. And this is kind of what happens, um, at, for example, at a delta. This is, you know, at, at the, the mouth of the, uh, the Mississippi. You have areas where it's been deposited, then the water sort of gets, like, 
uh, push, you know, like it has nowhere to go briefly, it'll go around something and then create new and new paraded streams. Shaping stream valleys, uh, streams change over time um, because of erosion. And so the next several slides I'm gonna talk about are how when a river first forms through its sort of life cycle and ultimately it's sort of uh, equilibrium type of uh, where it's going to be for a while, if that makes sense, I hope. So the base level is the lowest point a stream can erode to, and there's usually two types. The ultimate one, which is sea level, okay, um, you know, ultimately all streams end up back at sea level, that's like the Mississippi River down in Louisiana, um, or a temporary uh, base level based on, let's say, a resistant bed or let's say an earthquake event that creates, you know, along a fault or something like that, that can create a temporary situation. Well, I'll show you a slide of that. And then when anything changes like that, the stream readjusts itself based on its deposition and erosion patterns. So here, let me show you an example of that. So if you look at uh, letter A there, you have a stream that's just flowing downhill, doing its own thing prior to some type of faulting event. Then you have a faulting event, let's say an earthquake, where it pushes up, right here's the fault, it's pushing this up, so to speak, <clears throat> along a resistant bed here, which then creates a waterfall. So that's why we see waterfalls, there's sort of a break in the rock pattern, and uh, not all waterfalls like that, but a lot of them. So you have this waterfall, well over time, the water is going to erode over this, you know, the resistant bed will eventually start to erode. And over time, it's gonna erode itself back. You see there's sort of this V shape here. It erodes itself back. And then over, there's less and less of a waterfall. Now there's just rapids. And ultimately, over time, depending on, you know, on the power, the power of the, uh, the uh, river, over time, it's eventually going to flatten itself out and return back to what was in letter A, where it's just now a river that goes down and ultimately leads out to sea level. So that's sort of the phases of this, is you'll have uh, an initial river. If anything changes along that river path in terms of, let's say, in this case, a fault or uh, that it all to, it changes its patterns over time, but given enough time, the river will essentially flatten itself back out just by the nature of water eroding away everything around it. Valleys are the valley starts are shaped by weathering, overland flow, like how the water flows over, and mass wasting. Now, what does that mean? How much? Um, how if it's the water is super steep, it can create you know rock falls and um, uh, uh, landslides and things like that, which can sometimes change the route of the river. So narrow valleys are typically V-shaped, and that usually means you're at the headwaters, you have a higher gradient and a more resistant rock. Um, so you're cut, it's cutting down into that V-shape and incised meanders. You can still get meanders but they're in a V-shape type uh, incisement. <clears throat> now, like I mentioned, narrow valleys typically have your rapids and waterfalls. This is where you're going to, you know, go whitewater rafting and things like that. Um, and then as the water comes out of those valleys and everything starts to open up more, the velocities slow down, then you start to get meanders and you get, uh, 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 downward erosion is less dominant and it starts to go from side to side, again, creating those meanders. So here's an example of a V-shaped valley at Yellowstone River. And I, I have seen this, it is absolutely breathtaking, um, and very cool. So you could see those very, that very, very steep um, V-shape. So this rock in here, while it is, being eroded, that is true, it's very hard rock and takes a long time to erode. That's why you still have this narrow channel. If this rock was easily um, able to be eroded, you wouldn't have that kind of shape. It all has to do with the composition of the rock around it. 
So here's, again, sort of that uh, erosional development of a floodplain. So once you get back to the point where the, the water is flowing in a more sort of straight line, lazy flow along not real high gradients, you get these, first you have the narrow valleys like we just saw, but eventually what happens is things start to, um, uh, the water starts to erode at the sides and you start to get these meanders. They go back and forth and back and forth. And the erosion is taking place on the outsides of these. <clears throat> and then deposition takes place on the inside. So you get, you go back and forth and you create sort of this wider valley because the water is eating away at the, you know, especially at the tips of these, these bends here. Then over time, you get even wider valleys, what we call a well-developed floodplain. You can see here's one side of it and here's the other side of it. And if you go out to Prairie du Chien, like I mentioned a few slides ago, where the Wisconsin meets the Mississippi River, you can plainly see the, the, the entire width of the, the floodplain valley. Um, it, it's, it's cool, actually. So on the Iowa side of the river, it, you have some cliffs, and then it's very flat. You have the Mississippi River in there, some tributaries in the Wisconsin River. And over on the Wisconsin side, you have, you know, both sides of, it goes back up into the hills again. You have this very, very well-defined floodplain because the river has essentially cut away at it and you ultimately, those floodplains, while they do flood, end up being some of the most fertile farmlands there are, there are. So wide, uh, wide valleys contain the floodplains. You get the mea uh, what are called meanders. Those are the back and forth. You get cutoffs, which I believe I have a slide to show you, along with oxbow lakes. What happens is those meanders become so steep in their meandering that they essentially uh, cut through themselves, creating what are called cutoffs and then also oxbow lakes. Let me show you. So here's a meander, okay? So here's a very, very pronounced meander on the Colorado River. So it comes all the way out here, all the way out here, all the way over here, and all the way over there, right? Someday, probably not in our lifetime, this is being actively eroded right here. That's being actively eroded and will eventually cut right through this. Once it cuts through that, this whole thing here will is going to be essentially wiped away and the, all the sediment will, will sit right here. It'll actually cut through and create a shorter path. This water here will stay here. This is called the cutoff. This is called an oxbow lake. You see these all the time along the Mississippi River, especially down in St. Louis, you know, like Missouri area, Tennessee area, Arkansas area. So <clears throat> the, it, that's what creates these. And then eventually this could cut through as well. It depends on which one is first. So um, this this could do it just as easily. That maybe this one this one over here is more resistant, so the water comes around and eventually cut through here, leaving all this water behind. So there's lots going on there and rivers are highly dynamic systems. They're always changing. You may not see it with the naked eye, but they're there, those changes are there. And the bigger the river, the more changes are gonna take place. Now floods are the most common hazard along a river, obviously. If it rains too much, all of a sudden, you're gonna have rivers, their, their water levels get higher, higher, and higher. But it's not just rain. You can also have human interference in terms of levees being built, dams being built, or you know, in the case of the Army Corps of Engineers trying to uh, you know, tame <laughs> the Mississippi River um, so flooding can occur. Um, if most of you probably don't remember this, but back in 1993 was one of the worst Mississippi flooding events in human history. Um, it was crazy how bad it was. Um, the, you know, there were parts of like St. Louis and Memphis that were under like 15 feet of water. I mean, it, it, <laughs> pretty crazy stuff.
You have engineering efforts that try to keep the water contained to the main river channel, mainly for shipping purposes. So the, the Mississippi River, there's always barges going up and down the rivers carrying all kinds of stuff. And so they've not only built locks and dams because of the change in elevation, they've also had to build levees and uh, flood control dams and channels <clears throat> in order to maintain the channels for the, the ships, so they also dredge as well, but also so the people that live by there don't get inundated by floods because they're narrowing the channel um, in, in a man-made way as opposed to letting the river just sort of take its course. It's a nonstop battle. Uh, once they decided to start doing this along the Mississippi, the work that, on that never stops. It, it never, ever stops because the Mississippi River never stops. So, oh, look at that. I just <laughs> mentioned it. So here's the Mississippi River in 1991. Okay. The Mississippi River. This is the Missouri River. So this is St. Louis right here. All right. Look at how wide this was during the 93 event. I mean, it was insane. I remember watching this stuff on the news how bad it was and a lot of that is this, so there's dams and everything down here you could see how far backed up it got like i said this is st louis right here i lived there for two years and, and this whole area out here was just decimated there were you know it was crazy how bad the flooding was take a go up to google and take a look at some of the images from the 93 flooding event it was it was really nuts. We'll now switch our attention over to groundwater, which is water that's beneath the surface. And now, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not important, because you can see right there, groundwater is the largest freshwater reserve reservoir for humans, not only for drinking purposes, obviously after you filter it and everything, but irrigation is the big one. Um, all of the crops in Kansas, you know, Nebraska, Iowa, all those places, they all they're all using groundwater as uh, you know from wells down in the, the groundwater reservoirs. And there are some other things that can take place with um, groundwater. Water, like I we've been mentioning, dissolves everything around it pretty much, which can create things like sinkholes and caverns. Now, sinkholes are a huge problem down in Florida. Um, if you look a map of Florida, you know, a, a decent map, you'll notice a lot of their lakes are sort of circular in, in uh, nature. A lot of that is because they form from sinkholes. The groundwater is just under the surface in Florida. And because so many people are moving to Florida, they're pumping more of the groundwater out which creates caverns underneath. These caverns then eventually sink under their own weight, and you've had entire neighborhoods and you know cars and houses just sink down. Go look it up; it's pretty spectacular. Not if it's your car or your house, but um, so it, it, it's pretty crazy what uh, the groundwater when you pump it out, what can happen. And also, groundwater is an equalizer of stream flow, so. Um, as it, it, as water flows, that water isn't just flowing down a river, it's also flowing down into the sediment and eventually gets down into the groundwater system. So groundwater and rivers play sort of symbiotic role with each other, they need each other. Um, not all water from rivers gets into the groundwater, just like not all wa water from a precipitation event gets down into the groundwater. A lot of it just gets flowed away. But, you know, you, it has to, uh, they play a role with each other in that regard. Now, the distribution and movement of groundwater has a, a lot to do with the amount of uh, soil and the zone of aeration, what we call uh, uh, porous and permeability. So what that means is, is, does the soil and the rock beneath it have tiny little holes, what we call pore spaces, that uh, can be filled with water. Right now they might be filled with air, but when water gets in there, can it hold the water? Um, some rocks are better at it than others. Now the other side of this is, okay, now once it has the water in it, 
can that water be moved from one place to another? And that's called permeability. So the water table is this zone of saturation where all of the pore spaces have been filled with water and that's where we get our groundwater from. And that's what we call the water table. So below that or above that, there's no water because let's say above that, there's a layer of rock that just doesn't support filling those, pore, those tiny little holes filled with water. And below that, the same thing. The water kind of stays in one, once it finds a layer of rock it can fill, it stays in that layer of rock, so to speak. And that's sort of the upper low layer of uh, limit of that zone of saturation. It's not just like the water just keeps flowing down and keeps flowing down. It, eventually, there'll be a layer of rock below that that the water can't flow through either. That's an impermeable layer, we call it. So when water can flow through it, it's permeable. When it can't flow through it, it's impermeable. So let's take a look at that. <clears throat> So we have wells, if you look at this, if you just go and drill a well like this without knowing where the water table is, that's why they call it an unsuccessful well. You also have um, this, um, these what are called perch water tables. So it's a smaller water table above the main saturated area. And you can see that here, we call this here an aquitard. Now, that's that impermeable layer I was telling about. It doesn't allow the water to sink down through it. So that's why we call it perched. It's, the, it's above the main water table. So then as you go down, you can see here in the unsaturated zone, this, there's no water able to be held in here. But below that, you get this zone of saturate, saturation, excuse me, where the bulk of the water is being held. Now this graphic is a little misleading. The water table is not that thick, okay? The water table is usually one layer that allows the water to, uh, one layer of uh, rock that allows the water to hold it. Now where you have lakes or where you have the water table reaching the surface, this is where you have natural springs. So there the water table is at the surface allowing the water to flow through freely right out of it. Um, I have actually drank spring water right out of the ground. I know you're not really supposed to do that, but I did it anyway. There's some out in the Kettle Moraine out in Waukesha County. The same thing applies with rivers. So the river flows here, and when it gets to the lowest point, it's at the water table because otherwise it would get sunk deeper and deeper into it, into the rock, excuse me. Now, I mentioned this already. I was assuming there's going to be a slide coming up on this. So the distribution is dictated of, the distribution of groundwater is dictated by how porous or how many uh, little tiny air spaces are allowed in the rock. And also the permeability, which I mentioned, is the ability to transmit water through those connected pore spaces. So if I have a sandstone, for example, a sandstone is a bunch of sand that's been glued together, usually with silica, um, over millions of years. And there's tiny little holes in between those sand grains, which allow the, the water to flow through it. So that would be a permeable layer. On the flip side of that, you have a clay. Clay minerals are sort of flat and platy, and they sort of they, they create this very tight seal with each other. And so therefore, that would be an aquitard. A clay layer would be an aquitard that does not allow the water to go either above it or below it. And then the aquifer is that permeable layer. That's what we call an aquifer, is the layer of rock that contains all the water in it. Some features that are associated with groundwater are things like hot springs and geyser, <clears throat> geysers. Excuse me. Um, hot springs are just that, where you have water that's been warmed from um, uh, igneous rock that's still really hot underneath the ground that's slowly cooling. So then it heats up the rock, or excuse me, the water in the water table. Uh, Iceland has probably the most magnificent hot springs in the world. They're just, it looks like a huge pool. And it's all warm mineral water. It's supposed to be really good for your health. The other one is geysers like Old Faithful in um, Yellowstone National Park. And those are intermittent. 
So there's a plumbing system down below and you have all this heat down there generated by a hot magma source. Uh, Yellowstone is a hot spot, just like Hawaii is. And then what happens is, is there's water that fills up that plumbing and over time, all that heat generates steam. Once that steam can't hold itself anymore, it kind of blows its top, releasing the geyser, you know, the big sploosh, and then it falls back down and then the cycle repeats itself. Now, how often that repeats itself is dictated by the amount of plumbing and the amount of heat that has to be generated. Um, you know, Old Faithful used to run every, I forgot what it was, 10, 15 minutes. There was a semi-large earthquake in that region and it altered the clock, so to speak, on Old Faithful because the internal plumbing got shifted around by that earthquake. So now it takes a little bit longer than it used to. There's Old Faithful, like I just mentioned. Now I did have a chance to get to see this and it is really cool. I got to see it blow off, I think three times while we were there. Cause I think it's every, oh God, I don't even remember. But this is a perfect example of you have this constant um, ball of heat under the way underground that's heating all of the water in the water table. And it kind of creates sort of a, a pressure cooker situation um, where it heats up that all that water. Eventually it can't hold itself anymore. It goes psh, up in the air. Very cool stuff. Some other features of associated with groundwater are wells. There are many areas like here in Wisconsin, or in Wisconsin, in Milwaukee, we run on municipal water. So when you turn your faucet on, you're getting water through the municipal system. However, there's many rural areas, even just out in Waukesha County, that aren't connected to a municipal surface service so they have to drill a well and they drink well water which isn't always very good tasting but so that um th that can form what's called a cone of depression um as you you suck more and more water down you're creating this drawdown which can ultimately affect other things and this is a huge issue in florida so they're sucking up so much groundwater that what it's doing is it's pulling in seawater. Seawater is salty, right? Salt water. So if that seawater gets into the groundwater system, that's when really bad things happen. <laughs> you can't have salt water in your drinking water. You'll get very sick. The other things are artesian wells. Artesian wells are uh, water wells that rise higher than the groundwater level and they just kind of naturally come out. And obviously a lot of, you know, artesian bottled water comes from this. It's an area where just it just naturally bubbles out of the ground because it's it's in a situation where the water well is higher than the groundwater and it just under gravity, it just kind of spurts out. So here's a cone of depression. So if I have a new well, that's going to be what's called a high capacity well, which is what most um, uh, municipal wells are if they don't have access to like a Great Lake, right? And as you suck that water down, what happens is this cone of depression comes down like this. So that means you have to drill deeper and deeper eventually to get um, to the water. So now if I wanted to put a well right here, I have to drill even deeper than I would have had to have right here. I hope that makes sense. So a well that was here, you can see it, that one, that well was in the water table. This well was in the water table over on the right. But now this high capacity well comes in, sucks up so much of the water that both the well on the left and the well on the right are now dry. And that's a huge issue, like I said, with municipal wells, because municipal wells are usually high capacity wells. There's, there's a bunch of them around the state of Wisconsin. Artesian wells, like I mentioned, are areas where um, if you put a well in, it's above the water table where the natural pressure of the water just allows the water to freely come up like this here. So, it, it, you know, it's think of it like a gusher, right? <laughs> you drill the well and it just naturally get because of the pressure, uh, relieving the pressure, it just goes. Psh. <laughs> Now, groundwater environmental issues are a huge, huge part of science. Uh, a lot of our students at UWM 
who graduate go off to do environmental consulting, which is usually associated with groundwater problems. Um, even though it's it, it's renewable uh, in that we have tons and tons of water, we think we do, um, you have to treat it like a non-renewable source because it takes a long time to renew a groundwater table, for example. That stuff takes time. The water just doesn't magically go from precipitation out of a cloud directly into the water table. It takes a long time for it to get to that point. So you have to treat it like a non-renewable source to ensure its health over time. <clears throat> and contamination can get in there very quickly. I did environmental consulting right before I worked at UWM where I would travel around the state and uh, we'd have wells put in a lot of times around gas stations. Every gas station has an underground tank. That's where they store the gas. That's why you don't see it. It's down in tanks. Well, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s, they put metal tanks down there. And what happens is over time, they corrode and they leak. And then that all that gas and gets into the ground and then ultimately into the groundwater. And I've literally been at uh, you know gas stations where I pulled, I, we put these tubes down there, it sucks some water out for us. And I've seen eight inches of water sitting on the water, or eight inches of gasoline sitting on the water table. So that's how much gasoline is leaked out into the groundwater system. It's crazy. You also have things like subsidence, um, where you pump out so much water that the ground is literally just going down and down and down. And the classic example of this is out in California. You know, California is one of the most fertile areas in the world in terms of the amount of uh, veggies that uh, have been, you know, veggies and farms and things that are grown there. So in 52 years of heavy pumping, you can see the difference. This is 1925 to 1977. That's how much the ground has gone down. That is crazy, crazy <laughs> when you think about it. Not only because of the ground subsidence, but that just shows you how much water they've pumped out. So, you know, like I said, unfortunately, it's not stopping. A lot of the water that they get now is being irrigated, or excuse me, uh, brought in via channels from the Colorado River, which has its own environmental issues. Now, <clears throat> groundwater is mildly acidic usually, it contains weak carbonic acid, which can then dissolve, thing, uh, dissolve calcite in limestone. Limestone is not a very hard rock, it's not like granite. So that can form things like caverns, which let's be honest, are really cool. I used to go caving years and years ago in Indiana. Uh, there's a ton of caves down in Indiana, it's sort of the Northern extension of uh, the Kentucky caves, mammoth caves. <clears throat> and that dissolves uh, that slightly acidic rock as it flow, oh, excuse me, slightly acidic water as it flows through the rock dissolves everything around it, creating things like uh, caverns. <clears throat> now caverns are usually found uh, in the zone of aeration. They can be, uh, you can get the stalagmites and the stalactites. Uh, stalactites are hanging from the ceiling, stalagmites grow up from the ground, all kinds of cool rock formations, uh, basically just from dripping water that contains calcite that's been uh, dissolved in the water. You also have areas of the world where you have what's called karst topography, where you have large areas of this taking place, where you have uh, lack, lack of good drainage and you have lots of water dissolving the rock. Now, one of the best examples of this in this country is in the area around Kentucky where the Mammoth Caves are. But if you want the best version in the world, you gotta go to China. There's an area in China that is just absolutely gorgeous. I wish I had a picture, maybe it's on the next slide, but um, it creates these amazing domes and it's just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, because it's all the water that's flowed through that region is dissolved uh, all of the and, uh, calcite in there, creating lots of caverns and lots of uh, these mounds of calcite. And you got to see it. 
look up uh, karst topography in China to check that out. So here's the last slide for this chapter, um, the sort of development of karst topography. You get water flowing through it. You have limestone as sort of your bedrock, which it, it creates things like this narrow channels. Then you start to get sinkholes, like I mentioned, in Florida. Um, and you can get all kinds of caves and springs because the water table is perched up here. You get all these voids down here. Those are caves down in there. And sometimes they collapse, which is not fun. You don't want to be in those. So um, I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I know it's a little bit quick. Um, gr water is a vital resource for us humans. We have to have it. And it also creates some of the coolest effects on land, uh, you know, on Earth because of, of its nature to be able to dissolve everything or erode everything around it. So as a, a stream flows, it uh, dissolves things. You'll see in the, the short chapter on glaciers, that's water too, but it's wa very, it's, uh, you know, frozen water, which acts like a river that just grinds everything. So whether it's frozen, whether it's in precipitation form, you know, water vapor, whether it's flowing in a river, water is always shaping everything around us. It's one of the, the main factors why we have the landscapes we do. Like I said, either in for frozen form in a glacier or in running water form. You wouldn't have the topography of Wisconsin here in the southeast part of Wisconsin if it wasn't for glaciers, which again, we'll talk about later in chapter 10. Or you wouldn't have the, you know, the, the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon wouldn't be there if the Colorado River didn't did, erode away all of the layers creating that phenomenal uh, Grand Canyon, which I've never seen. I've never had a chance to get out there and see. Uh, but, you know, that that's a perfect example of what the, the beauty that river can, uh, or excuse me, the beauty that water can form um, or the Mississippi River with all of its meanders. I mean, I can go on and on and on. So water is a powerful, powerful voice and a vital resource in terms of the groundwater for, you know, not over pumping it. Uh, they have better irrigation techniques to sort of alleviate the groundwater issues that occur, especially in the breadbasket states like Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and the Dakotas. Um, then you have the issues of pollution from things like gas stations and everything that, you know, once it gets out on the land, water will touch it at some point with precipitation and ultimately will get back into the groundwater system. And then things like saltwater intrusion in Florida, where you're pumping the water too fast to fit, fill the needs of all the people that need drinking water. Unfortunately, once that, that um, salty water from the ocean gets in there because the, you know, the groundwater is right below the surface in Florida, Florida is only a couple feet above sea level. Um, and so it's it, it's a, main, a real big issue down there. Well, I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you in chapter 10, which is only on glaciers. We're only going to cover the glaciers portion, which is more relevant for us anyway around here in Wisconsin. I'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye.